the Tampa Bay Buccaneers can call themselves world champions, winning Super Bowl 55 against the Kansas City Chiefs 31-9. Tom Brady has proven that he can win all on his own. So are we ready to close a chapter on the brady Belichick debate? As we transition into the offseason, the Houston Texans are in the worst possible scenario. But it can be fixed. We'll break down different transactions with the Houston Texans that will benefit them this offseason. From one franchise in doubt with the quarterback situation to another, Carson Wentz wants out of Philadelphia. Which team will he play for in 2021? Post-Super Bowl news and notes and all those topics that we just mentioned on a brand new episode of Time to Football. Hello, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us. My name is Hassan Khan, the host of the show. Yes, to answer your question, we are doing this throughout the offseason. I understand football is not going to be happening for another six months. You guys are going to be lonely. You guys are going to be missing it. But if you guys subscribe and listen to us here at Time to Football, we'll get you guys covered and we'll get you guys entertained with all the NFL notes and news going around the league because there's so much going on in the next six months. There's free agency. There's uh, the NFL draft. There's trades that's going to be happening. There's a lot of debates and topics that we're going to be talking about, and we want to get you guys entertained and covered and caught up with all that on Time to Football. If you guys are watching this video up on YouTube, as we premiere this every Thursday night at 7 p.m., be sure to you, you subscribe to this channel so you can stay notified when we come out with more podcasts every single Thursday night. And if you guys are listening to us over on the podcast app on iTunes, make sure you guys subscribe to us so you can listen to us on the go. Head over to our YouTube channel as well, youtube.com slash time to football. Subscribe to us on there as well. And if you guys are joining us on the chat on YouTube, how you guys doing? I'm going to be joining you guys every single Thursday throughout the off season uh, to chat with you guys and just hang out. Let's just talk about football and talk about the topics that we're going to be talking about on this show as well. Before we move on to those topics, I want to say a big thank you to uh, Feedspot.com. We mentioned them before on this podcast. They ranked us as at, at number 72 and number 74. I'm not quite sure which one, but in the top 100 NFL podcasts in the world, not just the US, but in the world, we were ranked number 72 and number 74. Feedspot, throughout our whole entire Super Bowl coverage that we came out with, which has been a, a, a phenomenal two weeks and I can't thank you guys enough for listening and, and having the opportunity to uh, tune in and watch those interviews that we had with those amazing players as well. But during that Super Bowl coverage, that bumped us up in the Feedspot.com list to number 17. We're the 17th best NFL podcast in the world, according to Feedspot.com. So Feedspot, thank you so much for acknowledging us. We are ranked higher than uh, people that have podcasts with The Athletic, people that have podcasts with CBS, the Pick 6 Pod, and other former players that have podcasts as well. ESPN, uh, a couple of their reporters have podcasts as well. We are ranked higher than them. And it's a big thank you to Feedspot for acknowledging and uh, giving us that that wonderful ranking. We take it for uh, we don't take it for granted. We're very grateful for it. We're grateful for you, the time to followers, time to listeners, time to faithful, whatever you guys want to call yourself. You guys have been a big reason why this podcast has been possible. So thank you guys so much for tuning in every single week. We're going to get into the topics for this week's show. But first, before we get into that, for the final time, this season at least, we have to give you the Hungriest Player of the Week. Hungriest Player of the Week. The one that wanted it the most. Listen. The Super Bowl MVP means that you're the player of the game, right? So it should be Tom Brady. Tom Brady's the player of the game. He should be the hungriest player of the game. But the thing is, the hungriest player of the week award doesn't go to just the person with the best stats, but it goes to the person that stepped up and really led their team to victory. When you really counted them out, they stepped up big when it mattered the most. There's a lot of quarterback favoritism out there, okay? with the Super Bowl MVP award as well. For instance, uh, there's been years before where Aaron Rodgers, when he won the Super Bowl in 2010, he was named the Super Bowl MVP, which he had a great performance. But Greg Jennings had two touchdowns, two of his three touchdowns. You wouldn't think that it'd be harder for a wide receiver to get two touchdowns than a quarterback to throw for three touchdowns. James White in Super Bowl 51 was robbed at the Super Bowl MVP award, had 14 catches, and had the game-winning touchdown against the Atlanta Falcons in that amazing comeback. But Tom Brady was given the award because of quarterback favoritism. This year, 
we might have seen a little bit of favoritism with the quarterback position as well. Because my hungriest player of the week and who I believe should have been the Super Bowl MVP, Rob Krakowski. Six receptions, 67 yards, and two receiving touchdowns. Receptions and the yards, okay, cool, whatever. Mediocre. The two touchdowns, pretty freaking good for a tight end that you thought was going to be the uh, second string tight end at this point. Cameron Brait really stepped up as the number one tight end in the last few weeks. But Rob Krakowski came back and dominated in that game. First two touchdowns of the game, actually, as a matter of fact, for the Buccaneers, came from Rob Krakowski. Tom Brady throwing those touchdowns. Tom Brady did not throw for that many yards, threw for three touchdowns, but two of them were to Rob Gronkowski. If Brady threw for four or five and two of them were to Gronk, yeah, I understand why you would give Brady the the MVP just because of the ratio, but three touchdowns and two of them were to Gronkowski, you would think that Gronkowski would be deserving of the Super Bowl MVP. That's just my thoughts. You guys interact with us in the chat. Do you believe that Gronkowski should have been the Super Bowl MVP? Or do you believe that Brady was deserving of it? Brady had a great performance. I'm not taking anything away from that, but I feel like it should have been Gronkowski. But if he can't win the Super Bowl MVP, he's going to win the Hungriest Player of the Week award on this show. So thank you guys. Uh, check down for stealing my award. You guys suck. But the final Hungriest Player of the Week award goes to Rob Gronkowski, at least for the 2020 season. NFL news and notes going around the league that we want to get you caught up with because there's still lots of news going around, even post-Super Bowl. Let's talk a little bit about the quarterback carousel that's going on. After Matthew Stafford and Jared Goff exchange franchises, it seems like nobody is off the table. As a matter of fact, Russell Wilson has come into topics now and into debates on being traded from the Seattle Seahawks. It all started when Russell Wilson stated that he liked to be involved with more personnel decisions with the Seattle Seahawks. This is news that just came out this week. And he said that he was frustrated with the amount of times that he's been sacked. Ever since he came to the NFL, he's been sacked for almost 400 times, which is a lot of a lot of times. Would have been more if he wasn't just so mobile and at, was so great at escaping the pocket. But a lot of teams have inquired uh, according to, uh, I don't know how, Reliable the sources, but Jason Lockenfora of CBS, who has been known in the past to come up with, uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't want to really get into it. I don't want to burn any bridges, but uh, Jason Lockenfora has been in the uh, in, in talks before in debates about uh, making up some news. But he has stated that the Miami Dolphins have come out and uh, inquired about Russell Wilson, seeing that they would be willing to trade Tua Tagovailoa to Seattle and response get Russell Wilson and the Miami Dolphins would trade some draft picks on top of that as well so Wilson is in some conversation to get uh, traded the Seahawks have come out and said that no that's not happening which I don't blame them I understand speaking of more quarterbacks that are under trade conversations the Raiders are looking to to answer uh, or hear out teams at least answer some questions about Derek Carr potentially being traded by the Las Vegas Raiders But it's not just Derek Carr that other teams are inquiring about. It's also another quarterback with the Las Vegas Raiders. Nathan Peterman. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm I'm just making sure you guys are paying attention. Marcus Mariota, also in the conversation. He came in during that primetime game in relief of Derek Carr. Stepped up big time. Looked pretty freaking good. Maybe he might have another career resurgence. And some people, according to Ian Rappaport, are calling Marcus Mariota to be the next Ryan Tannehill, where it didn't work out with his previous situation, ironically in Tennessee. Comes into another franchise and could have a uh, a career resurgence like Tannehill did when he came uh, to Tennessee out of Miami. So Marcus Mariota and Derek Carr both are in conversations to be traded. Another quarterback that is going to be staying put with a franchise that he has after signing a contract extension, Taylor Heineke, the Washington football team quarterback that played that playoff game against Tom Brady and had a great showing, signed a two-year $8.75 million contract extension to stay with the Washington football team. More than likely, he's going to be uh, fighting for that starting spot for the Miami, or for the Washington football team. Let's see if Taylor Heineke can get it done once again. Collins Hill grad, Gwinnett County, shout out. This is where this uh, show is filmed. So Heineke, we are rooting for you, and uh, hopefully you have a chance of winning that starting quarterback job. Darren Waller, the Raiders tight end, says that they aren't that far away from the Kansas City Chiefs. They were close in beating them both times this season. 
I mean, they beat them once. At one of the two losses that they had last year, the Chiefs did, was against the Raiders in that 40-32 to win. But another game that they had in primetime Sunday night football, they almost won yet again against the Chiefs. And they feel like, Darren Waller at least, they're not that far away from the Chiefs. I mean, the Raiders, talented roster. Do you guys believe that they have a chance to uh, top the Chiefs in the AFC West or at least compete and give them a shot uh, or make it hard for them to win the division in years to come? Patrick Peterson, the all-pro cornerback for the Arizona Cardinals. A source came out and said that Peterson is done with the Arizona Cardinals. He's going to be looking somewhere else to sign and play his NFL career. Peterson came out on the pod, on the podcast of Bryant McFadden, a former NFL defensive back, and stated that that's just a quote-unquote dirty rumor. He hasn't made a decision yet on whether he's going to be leaving or not. So it's not out of the question that he leaves, but for a source to come out and say that, yeah, it's guaranteed that he's going to come out and leave, I don't know, man. Is it Jason Lockenfora yet again reporting that? I don't know. Oof. Hopefully he doesn't watch this podcast. I'm going to make some uh, mortal enemies for sure. Orlando Brown, another Gwinnett County grad, Peachtree High School, Peachtree Ridge High School, that is, requests a trade from the Baltimore Ravens. And that isn't because he isn't confident in the Baltimore Ravens and John Harbaugh and, and, and the future that they have and potentially making a Super Bowl run, but because he wants to play left tackle. He's been starting at right tackle for the most of his or for the majority of his entire NFL career. Prior to that, he was playing left tackle in college and high school, and that's what really shined and, and got him to be so good. But then when the NFL combine came, he was struggling on pro days as well to play left tackle, and his draft projection dropped from the first round to a third round pick. They switched him over to right tackle to see if he had any sort of success. He didn't. Switched him over to left tackle in 2020 to make up for some injuries that they had at the offensive line. Has been looking great. So now Orlando Brown is set on playing left tackle, so unless the Ravens put him there permanently, which more than likely may not happen just because they have a lot of depth on that defensive line or that offensive line. They might be shipping him out and trading him away. And then last but not least, the Broncos release A.J. Bouye, a defensive back who had some pretty good years. I would say one or two good seasons in Jacksonville. And then kind of fell off, got signed by the Broncos in the offseason, and, and now it's seeming like that the Broncos are moving on after releasing him this week and those are your nfl news and notes post super bowl moving on to this week's topics man that super bowl by the way was a great game i loved it (laughs) you may say 31 to 9 that's boring we thought it was going to be high scoring back and forth between mahomes and brady but i love every single down of football even if it's a defensive play that's a sack or, or a minus two yard loss or an incomplete pass i love the game of football and that Bucks defense, phenomenal. Devin White is going to be one of the best linebackers in the NFL for the next few years. He's he's up there. It was Levante David that was very underrated, and I feel like Devin White is going to continue to be that underrated linebacker for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But great defense by the Buccaneers, and then great by Tom Brady to win that game, win his seventh Super Bowl. But Patrick Mahomes, even though he threw two interceptions in that game, it was the greatest game that I've ever seen by a losing quarterback by that much, if that makes any sort of sense. So you you know that quarterbacks or, or teams can be close and lose a close game, and the quarterback on the other side of the losing team has a great performance. Patrick Mahomes, if you look at his stats, not that good of a performance. If you look at the game and you look at the score and how out of reach it was, not that good of a performance. But if you watched it with your eyes and you watch every single down of football and every single throw that Mahomes made, Listen, I know that Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time. No one, no one, I'm calling it right now. I mean, we've called it for years. Can ever reach him as far as Super Bowls and accomplishments go. Brady's going to go down as the greatest. But as far as pure talent goes, who's the best and and talented right now in football? Ah, man, Mahomes. Mahomes is up there. I think he's one of the best, uh, most talented quarterbacks that we've seen in the NFL Ever. I'm calling it right now. But Brady wins his seventh Super Bowl, his first away from Bill Belichick, which is what we wanted to talk about with our first topic. He leaves New England with many people saying that he wanted to prove that he can win on his own, that he wasn't respected by New England, and he wanted to win a Super Bowl on his all on his own. And the whole entire offseason last year, the debate was, was Belichick or Brady the reason that the New England Patriots won six Super Bowls. Good debate. 
And as of right now, if you look at it, Tom Brady's winning that debate. Tom Brady has proven that he can win without Bill Belichick. But are we ready to close that chapter 100% and just give the keys to Tom Brady and say, yes, you were the sole reason why the Patriots were so successful? First off, let me say, he's the greatest quarterback of all time. I'm a big Tom Brady fan. I love, I've been watching Tom Brady for a very long time. I've been watching football since 2006. So I grew up watching Tom Brady and on the New England Patriots when he had that amazing, uh, what could have been an undefeated season, thrown for 50 touchdowns, win that NFL MVP when he was the unanimous NFL MVP uh, in 2010, 36 touchdowns to four interceptions, go to conference championship after conference championship after conference championship. Tom Brady, greatest quarterback of all time. And if you don't agree, you're emotionally hurt. You're letting your emotions get to you. Just look at the facts. Look at the statistics. Look at the accomplishments. Okay, take your emotions out of it. I don't know whether you're Peyton Manning Homer. I don't know if you love Joe Montana so much. I don't know if you're an oldie and you love those old school quarterbacks like Dan Marino, Terry Bradshaw, and all those people. None of them compare to Tom Brady and what he's done in the NFL. So first off, to preface, Tom Brady, you have to admit this, is the greatest quarterback of all time. So look at me. Do you admit it? All right, good. Now that you admit it, Let's get into this debate. Greatest quarterback of all time. But we can't close the chapter in this book just yet. We can't come out and say that Tom Brady is the sole reason that the Patriots have been so successful just yet. It's trending that way. But as of right now, it's looking like we may need to see yet one more season from both from Belichick with the Patriots and Brady with the Bucks before we can make an inclusive decision on that. The reason I say that is because I believe, to just get it out there first, something about Bill Belichick being the greatest quarterback of all time or being the greatest coach of all time and Tom Brady being the greatest quarterback of all time, mixing together was a perfect marriage that just worked. It works so well. And if you take one away from the other, then one's going to suffer. Maybe it's not going to be as much, but it's going to be just a bit. Because if you think about it, you have to look at scenarios if you were to replace certain people right now. If Bruce Arians was replaced by Bill Belichick, and he had Tom Brady, he had Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, Antonio Brown, all these, the star talent, the great defense that he has. If Bill Belichick came to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and was the head coach, would they still win the Super Bowl? The answer is yes. I believe they would. I believe a lot of people would say that to be correct. Bruce Arians, very good coach, but I think that Bill, Belichick has proven to be better uh, as of right now. So I think that Belichick could have won a Super Bowl if he was the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, If you were to replace Tom Brady, Belichick is a coach, but you replace Tom Brady with someone like uh, one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL, Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, you know, one of the top five quarterbacks in the NFL, Russell Wilson, maybe even, would the Buccaneers still win the Super Bowl? The answer is yes. I 100% believe that if you replace Tom Brady with another top five quarterback in the NFL and Bill Belichick was the head coach, they would have won a Super Bowl. Because Brady signed with the Bucks, which smart on his part, to win another a Super Bowl, great on his career, going to a place where he had weapons and then other people seeing that and wanting to restructure their contracts to stay with Tampa Bay, other uh, talented players getting released by their teams but wanting to sign with the Bucks for a little amount of money because all this talent wanted to come to Tampa Bay because Tom Brady signed there you can't come to a conclusive conclusion and say that Tom Brady was a sole reason for the Patriots success just because he won yes on his own but you got to look at the roster we saw what Tom Brady could do with the roster that they had with the Patriots and what you can do with that roster is you can go 10 and 6, you can make a wild card spot, and you can lose in the wild card round. 
That's what you can do, which is much better than what Cam Newton has done. Let's just acknowledge that. Cam Newton did not work out. That experiment was not great. They went 7-9, and nine, missed the playoffs. So Brady has proven with that roster, that's pretty much the same roster that they had last season, uh, that they had this season, that he's proven that to, to be three games better than Cam Newton. That's the effect that he has on the Patriots as opposed to Cam Newton and the roster that they have. But if Belichick was given the same amount of roster that, or the same kind of roster that the Bucks had, would we be talking about Belichick being the reason that the Patriots had so much success? I mean, I think that they would have a chance at making the playoffs or at least the Super Bowl. And I think that because of that, you can't come to, like I said, a conclusive saying and say which one was the reason for the success in New England. If Belichick had a similar roster, he'd win. He'd have a top five quarterback, a former top five pick at running back, three number one receivers, best tight end in NFL history, the best run defense, two of the best linebackers in the NFL, the defensive rookie of the year candidate in the secondary. That's what Belichick would have to work with if he had the Tampa Bay Buccaneers roster. If Brady had Belichick's roster, no standout receivers, disappointing running back room, your top wideout is 34 years old, no good tight ends. Brady would help the Patriots win maybe two or three more games, but that's it. Maybe 10 to 6 and could miss the playoffs. Like I mentioned earlier, the greatest quarterback of all time, the greatest coach of all time, coming together to form a perfect marriage and a dynasty that lasted 20 seasons. Take them apart, away from each other, the greatest quarterback of all time has proven that he can win on his own. The greatest coach of all time, so far, hasn't. And a lot of that has to do with him being a general manager. Very, very poor job in recent years. Not wanting to draft a quarterback of the future. Not wanting to draft a uh, star-studded tight end that he had like in Rob Gronkowski and drafting failure tight end after failure tight end every single season. But as a head coach, if you were given the right pieces and a good roster, could Bill Belichick win on his own? The answer, in my opinion, I believe that he can. But he has to be given the right roster. However, so far, Brady has the upper hand, and he has the edge. But leave your comments down below and leave your thoughts. Do you feel like that it was just one person that was responsible for the Patriots dynasty? Do you believe that it was Tom Brady? Or do you believe that both of them just clicked and just came together and something happened for them to be so successful for 20 seasons? Leave your thoughts in your comments down below. We mentioned dynasties in this next team. Far from being a dynasty. Bill O'Brien ruined the Houston Texans. The front office of the Houston Texans had nothing to do with Bill O'Brien. I feel sorry for them because Bill O'Brien for years and years as a general manager was trying to be cute, was trying to play franchise mode and, and just do all these ridiculous trades and free agent acquisitions and a trading away draft picks. And now they find themselves in this ridiculous hole that they can't get out. We like to be positive on the show. We like to show optimism. So we're going to show you what is the best case scenario for the Houston Texans. How do you get out of this hole of not having draft picks in the first two rounds of being $8.5 million over the cap, what's projected to be 17 million by the time free agency hits. What can you do? What transactions and moves do you need to make in order to be in the best scenario possible. So we thought we'd go on this website called spottrack.com. And uh, by the way, spottrack.com is where I go for all of my f contract signings to get information on that. So whether it be players, and I want to see how many years they have left on their contract, how much money they're owned in, in years to come, uh, salary caps for teams and franchises as well, spottrack.com. We're not sponsored by them, by the way. N nowhere near sponsored. We're just bringing them up because they're just so amazing. And so we wanted this website. Number one, we wanted to dive into the Houston Texans and uh, you know get a headache because this whole scenario is just ridiculous. How do you get out of this uh, hole that you're in? And number two, 
we went on this uh, uh, page and this website. And what's cool about this website, let me actually pull it up, is uh, you could see uh, different contracts. Uh, hold on, let me pull it up right now. Okay, cool. So let's pull it up. You could see different contracts uh, and, and numbers and manage your own kind of roster. So for instance, if I wanted to release Laramie Tunsil, I can press that red X where it says release. And then the cap space on the side, the negative 8.5 million, it'll adjust that, whether it be add more money or subtract money if they're due uh, some money or if there's some dead money for that year. But I just went ahead and played around with this and I came up with some uh, trades that a lot of different uh, teams could make for some Houston Texans players that'll free up some salary cap space for the Houston Texans so they can finally be in a good spot with the other NFL teams around the league. Listen, I know that the Jets and the Eagles, if you're fans of those teams, are in some tough spots as far as their roster goes, as far as the front office goes. But listen, it's nothing compared to the Houston Texans, so I apologize if you're a Houston Texans fan. So let me first start off and look at this and see which players do you need to release or trade away uh, on this Houston Texans roster. So a lot of people, if we look at the salary cap here for 2021, are due a lot of money. You got Laramie Tunsil, J.J. Watt, Deshaun Watson, Brandon Cooks. Uh, listen, all these guys are staple players. Okay, Laramie Tunsil, I don't feel like that the Houston Texans should move on from him. One of the best offensive linemen and tackles in the NFL. You give him up, you're giving up way too much. J.J. Watt, another story, okay? So there's a lot of players on this roster that are due a lot of money. Let's start off and let's go ahead and just play around with this and see what we can do to try to help this Houston Texans roster. So first, we've got to get rid of J.J. Watt. It's expected that J.J. Watt wants out of the Houston Texans franchise, wants nothing to do with it. He's not a fan of the front office and the moves that they made recently. Okay, cool. You want to move on? Fine, we got it. We're going to free up $17.5 million. So watch this. I'm going to go ahead and hit release because we have the trade option as well. But at 32 years old in that contract, it's hard to believe that J.J. Watt wants to be traded anywhere else. So he would ask for his release more than likely and would probably sign with a team like Pittsburgh so he could play with his brother. So we're going to hit this red X, release. And then once we hit that, you see on the side, now we're in the positive and cap space, 8.9 million dollars in cap space that we can spend on uh, pending draft picks if we were to get any uh, first round or second round draft picks. Uh, free agents as well that we want to re-sign uh, on our team. So J.J. Watt, he's cut, he's gone. That's probably going to have to be the first move that the Texans are going to have to make. Now you got to think about it. You got to think about other players that are expensive, given that the amount of uh, production that they're putting out versus the amount of money that they're making, who do you need to get rid of? Well, if we want to talk about cuts, we could also trade this player, but we could also cut Duke Johnson, the running back for the Texans, second string. You already have David Johnson to a $9 million contract. That's a lot of money. I understand, but he's your running back one. He was productive last year. You want to at least keep a solid run game on that team. So keep David Johnson for now. Duke Johnson, on the other hand, yes, he's great, but you can move on with him. He's making $5 million. You can trade him or release him. It doesn't matter because it's not going to go against the cap either way. So if you choose to, let's just say, for instance, uh, they want to trade away uh, Duke Johnson. So we pull up the trade uh, uh, menu, and uh, I don't know. What's a team that needs a running back? Is there a team that I... I Oof, man. Okay, well, let's just choose a random team. Uh, let's just go ahead and say the uh, Miami Dolphins could use a running back. They're probably not going to trade for Duke Johnson, but let's just go ahead and say that. You trade for a draft pick, whether it be a third round or fourth round or fifth round, or just given the value of Duke Johnson, you process that trade and you see that Duke Johnson is gone from our roster and you see on the side $13.9 million in cap space remaining. Okay, we're on we're off to a good start. You got rid of J.J. Watt. You got rid of uh, Duke Johnson. You have a lot of money that you can work with. Let's get a little bit more because we need to re-sign some key free agents like Will Fuller on this roster. So looking at this team, some players that we can see so far, if you look at the rank on the side, they're ranked uh, one through whatever based off of uh, how much money they're making. Randall Cobb, number six, is making a lot of money, but... His production at 31 years old, do you expect him to really do much for this team? 
Uh, you could get rid of Randall Cobb. So for, for instance, if we hit the release button right here, but that's going to go against your cap because of dead money and things like of that nature. So uh, because of his contract, it's actually going to bring us down about one or $2 million. So instead, let's just go ahead and redo that. Let's keep Randall Cobb for now. And same scenario if you were to trade him away as well. Who else on this team can we get rid of? Listen, it's going to suck for Houston Texans and that offense, given that you just gave away Duke Johnson. You're going to have to give away with another wide receiver that's expensive. And since Randall Cobb costs money against you, it's going to have to be Brandon Cooks. You're going to have to give him away. Brandon Cooks has been passed around way more than a blunt. He really has. He's been to team after team after team every single season. But the Texans, you're just going to have to move on with the expensive contract that he has. He's 28 years old. You could release him, yeah, but you could also try to get some draft picks out of, out of him like you did prior to the trade deadline in the 2020 season. So you could trade him. Let's say, for instance, we want to trade Brandon Cooks and to a team that would be uh, just for fun. Let's say that the, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, the Philadelphia Eagles could really use a wide receiver. Let's go ahead and trade Brandon Cooks to the Philadelphia Eagles. Let's process that trade. Processed it. Now look on the side. Look at the cap space. $25.9 million. This is what the Houston Texans can do. This is very realistic and, and, and realistic transa transactions that the Texans could make to move on from these expensive players to look ahead and rebuild for the future. Now you're at $25.9 million. You know what you can do with that money? You can re-sign Will Fuller. He's probably going to expect a contract of $15 million or more every single year. But because of the suspension that he had, you could deduct that maybe down to $12 or $13 million a year. Very affordable. There's one key transaction that we have left. What do we do with Deshaun Watson? He wants out of the Houston, Texas franchise. Do you want to pull the trigger and trade for him now so you can get the most out of him prior to the NFL draft? Or do you want to wait and see if he's actually going to play because you want to hang on to him? You want him to play, but is he going to hold out and just sit out until he's traded? That's a key scenario and a key decision that the Houston Texans front office has to make. But let's say that before the NFL draft, they want those first round picks, those second round picks. Uh, you traded away Brandon Cooks for, let's say, a second or third rounder. You could trade Deshaun Watson for another draft pick as well. You trade away Deshaun Watson, okay? You trade him to the New York Jets because you could trade him, listen, to the Carolina Panthers for Teddy Bridgewater. But Teddy Bridgewater has an expensive contract as well. If you're looking to get a quarterback in return for Deshaun Watson, the New York Jets for Sam Darnold would be the best option just because Sam Darnold is still playing on his rookie contract, only going to be making $4.7 million. So let's go ahead and choose the New York Jets right here. Trade Deshaun Watson to the New York Jets, and we can choose a player as well. Let's choose Sam Darnold, $4.7 uh, million dollars. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. So we're we'll process that trade. Uh, 4.7 million. And then look at the cap space on the side. Went down a staggering $10 million. And that's because of the money that uh, Deshaun Watson is owed. For the future, it's going to be the best decision just because you get rid of that big contract. But for now, you're going to have to eat something if you want to trade away Deshaun Watson f and get Sam Darnold's contract on top of that as well. So you're at $50 million. Now that leaves us in a tough scenario. You trade away Deshaun Watson. You could resign Will Fuller to maybe $12, $13 million, but that only, only leaves you $2 million or so to sign your draft picks, to sign any sort of free agents that you want. That's not the wisest decision. Let's just go ahead and recap uh, all the transactions that I made. You cut JJ Watt, you save $17.5 million. You cut Duke Johnson, you save $5 million. Trade Brandon Cooks, you save $12 million, and you get a draft pick. You could push for a second round pick, but more than likely, just because of the age that he's at, it's probably going to be a third rounder or below. But you get a draft pick out of that, which is great. Now, in that case, you got to think about, do you want $25 million to use to sign Will Fuller and other free agents, but you're going to have to keep Deshaun Watson and then take the risk of him uh, not playing and have a holdout and you don't get a first round pick in this year's NFL draft as well? Or do you trade away Deshaun Watson get that first round pick, get a superstar cornerstone player in the NFL draft, but you don't have enough money to re-sign Will Fuller on top of that and your receiving core. 
is at that point going to be led by Randall Cobb and Kiki QT with the amount of money that you have. Tough scenario, tough situation for the Houston Texans, but leave your comments down below. What do you think is going to happen? And if any of these transactions make any sort of sense, let us know. And if not, what are some other transactions that you would make if you were the Houston Texans organization? Moving on to another topic that we have real quick, Carson Wentz. No secret at this point that he wants to be traded. He wants out of Philadelphia. The Eagles front office at first said, no, we don't want to trade Carson Wentz. We love Carson Wentz. We don't understand why you would put Jalen Hurts in as a starter. Really? You want to understand that? I don't know, but that's what they said. They want to keep Carson Wentz, and part of that might have been the reason why Doug Peterson was fired for wanting to keep Jalen Hurts as a starting quarterback. But at this point, it's more than likely going to happen that Carson Wentz is going to be traded to another NFL franchise. The question is, which would be the best fit? For Carson Wentz, look at every quarterback needed team that's in dire need of a quarterback. The Carolina Panthers, they're not in need, but if you inquired about Matthew Stafford and you're willing to trade away Teddy Bridgewater, yeah, you're looking to move on and probably ask about another quarterback. Could be Carson Wentz. The Houston Texans, uh, they're not sure about Deshaun Watson and that whole scenario, and Deshaun Watson is not sure about the Houston Texans. So if they decide to move on with Deshaun Watson, Carson Wentz could be in the talks of becoming a Houston Texan. The New England Patriots are in need of a quarterback. It's not going to come back, or Cam Newton is not going to be coming back to New England. The Denver Broncos, John Elway is not sold on Drew Locke. He's inquired about other quarterbacks to be traded. So Carson Wentz is also in the conversation. The Washington football team, also in need of a quarterback as well. But two teams have come out in uh, as the front runners and the favorites to land Carson Wentz, and that is the Indianapolis Colts and the Chicago Bears. Which one of those two teams will Carson Wentz go to and which one would be the would be the best fit for the Colts the best spot would be the Indianapolis Colts for Carson Wentz I mean head coach of the Indianapolis Colts Frank Reich was the offensive coordinator for Carson Wentz during his MVP campaign in 2017 so given that and how Wentz wants to get reconnected with Frank Reich could have the same amount of success not only that, but they have a very established team and respectable team on top of that as well. That offensive line is good. That run game is good. Jonathan Taylor is going to be back. Marlon Mack isn't, but you got Taylor as a three-down back. You've got Naheem Hines as a change of pace, pass receiving back as well. And that defense is one of the best defenses in the NFL currently. The Indianapolis Colts, also a good fan base on top of that as well. Philly fans, they're rough. It's hard. It's hard being a Philadelphia Eagles player and not succeeding. So Carson Wentz has felt that. He's felt the uh, the wrath of the Eagles fans, not wanting them anymore. And he's willing to move on and go to a more place with or, or a place with more tame fans like the Indianapolis Colts in a good sports town. For the Chicago Bears, would this be a good fit for Carson Wentz? First off, there's been rumors out there that the Eagles are willing to trade Carson Wentz to the Bears in exchange for Nick Foles and some other draft picks that the Bears would be willing to give up. That would be wild. Nick Foles would go back. Carson Wentz, according to the rumors, did not want to have Nick Foles there as a backup because you never know. You never know what's going to happen. You never know if he's going to get hurt, Foles is going to come in, or Wentz is even going to lose a starting job to, to Nick Foles. And that would be frustrating on, on Wentz's part as well. So uh, those are just rumors, but they haven't come out and said that that is 100% true just yet. So let's just say what it is. It's just rumors for now. But he would get uh, to be with an offensive-minded coach in Matt Nagy, have somewhat of a run game with David Montgomery. But the thing is, the Chicago Bears fans, they're just as rowdy and just as wild and just as committed to their team as the Philadelphia Eagles fans are to their team. So I don't think Carson Wentz would want to go to a team like the Chicago Bears with fans uh, in the same environment as the Philadelphia Eagles. I understand it's not really up to him, but if he had some sort of say, uh, I don't think he would want to go to the Bears. So the Colts would make the best sense. And if Carson Wentz were to land with the Colts, would the Colts be a better team? And my answer, I think yes. I think Carson Wentz would do a better job and be more productive than Phillip Rivers, who was not that bad at all for the Indianapolis Colts. But I think that Wentz brings a little bit a different level of athleticism, different level of youth uh, to this team. And I think he would be uh, reconnected with his, like I said, former offensive coordinator when he was an MVP candidate in 2017. And I think that would be huge for Carson Wentz. So I feel like the Colts are the best spot. Is it going to happen? 
I don't know, could be happening in the next few days, could be already happening by the time you guys are watching this podcast. But leave your comments down below if it hasn't already happened yet. Who do you feel like would trade for Carson Wentz and who do you feel like would be the best spot uh, for Wentz moving forward? But that's going to bring a wrap to this week's podcast. Again, we appreciate you guys joining us for the whole entire duration of this week's show. Make sure you guys subscribe to this channel so you guys can stay up to date when we come out with this podcast every single week. Like I said, throughout the offseason, we're going to keep you updated with all the NFL news and debates and topics. And hopefully, just like Super Bowl week, which was a huge success that we had uh, interviewing those players pregame and postgame as well. We were hoping to reconnect with other players as well and have some player interviews on this podcast as well throughout the whole entire offseason. So make sure you guys stay up to date with all that. Vice versa, if you guys are on uh, iTunes, listen to us, go over to YouTube, youtube.com slash time of football, subscribe to us on there and rate and review on the podcast app on top of that as well. With all that said, thank you guys so much for uh, watching this week's episode. I'll see you guys next week. Mm-hmm.